According to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, about 37 million people in the U.S. suffer from sinusitis each year. Symptoms may include facial pain, congestion, loss of smell, headaches, and fatigue. Today we will discuss minimally invasive technologies that may offer relief to patients. I'm Roland Smith. Join me today as we discuss this new treatment. This is CHS, Long Island's Health Source. With me now is Dr. Philip Perlman, the Director of Otolaryngology at St. Francis Hospital. Also joining me is Patricia Moltisanti, one of Dr. Perlman's patients. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Patricia, we'll get to you in, in just a, cu sure. a couple of minutes here because uh, your story is a fascinating story and I'd like our viewers to, to hear all of it. Okay, great. Let's talk about sinusitis. What is it? Well, first we have to talk about what are the sinuses. Okay, because let's do that. Without knowing what the sinuses are, you don't know what sinusitis is. Basically, the sinuses are cavities, empty spaces in our skull. And basically, they're there for aeration and for drainage. And when the drainage gets blocked for whatever reason, then we start to get sinus symptoms and sometimes sinusitis. So if you take a look at my friend over here, this is a 3D image of what the sinuses are. And if you just kind of remove them, there are various passages. You've got the sinuses in your forehead, you have the sinuses in your cheek, around your eyes, and then one in the back called the sphenoid sinus. All these sinuses drain into our nose. Anything that blocks it from draining can cause a problem. Meaning pollen, meaning... Uh medical or uh, what chronic conditions that are, exist within certain people's sinuses well yes there's the anatomical problem which is like your typical deviated septum mm -hmm. the septum is a piece of cartilage inside our nose that separates the right and the left if that gets deviated either by birth or by injury nasal fractures or hereditary that can block the airflow of the nose also it can block the sinuses from draining ap appropriately other things like allergies can cause a problem with the sinuses because the allergies make the membranes all swell up and block the sinuses from draining well into the nose. We make about a liter of mucus a day and we swallow it. And what happens with our inflammatory polyps, usually due to allergies, but in Patty's case, it also is very much related to her asthmatic condition. There are uh, a good number of patients that have both asthma and nasal polyps. What happens is the polyps then act as the blocking forces of the sinuses. And she needs to be kept on medication probably forever, but on a low dose maintenance course. Now, when her sinuses get into, you know, disease states where they get infected a lot, that's when she comes to somebody like me who's a surgeon that can not only treat them medically but also if necessary surgically not every patient needs surgery but when everything else fails the nasal rinses the sprays the the medical therapy which sometimes can be long periods of time when that doesn't work then we have to look at other ways of treating it let's go back uh, in time 25 years ago how did you treat uh, the conditions you're talking about now compared to what you do today and then let's talk about some of the options for today okay basically the the number one option is preventative and medical okay to get the patient into the best medical state that they can be in whether it's treating their allergies and over here I have a whole bunch of sprays these are various nasal steroid sprays that sinus patients 
are on frequently to decrease the inflammation. Would that be something they would have used 25 years ago? Yes, they could have, yes. Okay. And they've made advances along the years to uh, increase the potency, less, uh, lessen the, uh, the problems that sometimes medicines can give you. Also very important is washing your sinuses, getting rid of all of the, the pollens, the, the allergens, the, the pollution that we breathe in every day. And a couple of things that are on the market you have the neti pot, which goes back hundreds and thousands of years. I'm not a big fan of the neti pot, but I do like this product. It's a sinus rinse product. And basically, it acts as a washing machine for your nose. You put a salt packet in here, you put some distilled water in there, and then over the sink, you just st gently squeeze it into your nose, and it kind of washes and irrigates everything away. Now, when you go through the antibiotics and the steroids and, and the sprays and the prevention, then you seek a surgeon to take care of your problems. Like you said, 25, 30 years what ago. What did you do 25 years ago to treat it? Okay. Back then, all we had was a headlight on our forehead and a nasal instrument to open up the nostril like this. And then using some grabbers, we were able to remove polyps or fix the septum. But over the last 20 years, amazing advancements have happened starting with a CAT scan. A CAT scan is an x-ray to show us what's going on inside. Then came the endoscopes, the fiber optic technology that gives us clear vision using TV monitors to see what's happening up close mm -hmm. and avoiding the areas that are you know, potentially dangerous. Then other instruments came out. There's a shaving instrument that shaves away tissues gently. There's less bleeding involved these days. I very rarely have to pack anybody after a sinus surgery. Back 25 years ago, we have to pack a lot of packing in there to keep the blood under control. One of the most important advances is this instrument over here, and this is a balloon, sinoplasty, similar to what cardiologists we use to open up the arteries of the heart. What happens is we have to get to the heart to reach sinuses. And I'll take this model. Yeah, sure. Where are they? As an example. This is, if you took the nose and you cut it in half, these are the different openings to the sinuses. This one up here drains the frontal sinus, which is one of the most difficult to reach sinuses. With a balloon, we put it right over here. I send a guided light up into the sinus, and then we take the balloon and we advance it like this. This goes into the sinus and we inflate it. And there's a balloon already on this inflation device and this balloon will gently inflate. Well, See that, just that. like that. Yeah. Just like a cardiologist would do inside a heart to mm -hmm. dilate the arteries and it gently dilates the frontal sinus duct and helps drain the mucus, what's ever retained in there. Once the dilation is done, does it last for a while? Well, so far we've been having excellent results with, with this uh, technique. This is not for everybody. Not everybody needs the balloon. Okay, that's a misconception. I have patients coming, oh, I want the balloon for my sinuses. It has to be indicated. Okay, it has to be sources that need this kind of technology. The frontal sinuses, sometimes the maxillaries. Uh, but the surgeon that uses this instrument knows exactly how to uh, gear the patient to the right procedure. How do you determine which... Uh, treatment is uh, optimum for an individual after they visit you? Well, again, you know, we assess the patient, we look at the CAT scan results. That's very, very important because a CAT scan is a road map to the sinuses. It'll tell us exactly which ones are blocked, mm -hmm. which ones are giving them problems. Listening to Patty's history, her symptoms, that directs me into a certain way. I look at her medical background, what has she taken in the past? Maybe the antibiotics were an optimum. Maybe the amount of steroids she was on was an optimum. And then you gear the surgical techniques to all those things that we mentioned. Was Patty a, a maximum case for you? She was difficult. <laughs> uh, you know, anytime somebody has a revision, uh, revision, that means they've been through this before, especially polyp patients. Uh, it, it's a little bit more difficult because there's a lot of scar tissue involved, a lot of recurrence of 
polyp growth. The anatomy isn't as good as you would like it to be because uh, it's been distorted already with previous surgeries and infections. So it's a little bit difficult. That's why with all these newer technologies, it's making it easier for the, the sinus surgeon to help the patient with minimum risks and, and uh, a lot easier recuperation. We'll be right back, but first we have a short video showing us how balloon sinoplasty works, so let's take a look. Our next patient is Mrs. Siegler, who has uh, come to see us in the past after two previous sinus operations and had frontal sinus problems, of course, along with stenosis. Uh, we've operated on her twice ourselves. Uh, her frontal sinuses are open, but they're just open. Uh, I'll give you a look here. Uh, you can see there's a great deal of tissue missing in here. Middle turbinate is uh, largely missing. We have superior turbinate still. And here's the opening to the frontal sinus, which is fairly small. Uh, I'm getting ready to push the solo up the wire, one-handed. So here it goes in. So we can see the balloon passing into the frontal sinus now. And I'm going to back the sinus guide down a little bit at the same time. And Kathy's getting ready to inflate this. So we'll take this picture now and go. Go to one, go one atmosphere at a time. Okay, now let's take this picture. Mrs. What's happening, Mrs. Siegler? I can feel it opening. So this is the seven millimeter opening. Beautifully open. And we can see all the way to the roof of the frontal sinus here, so in good shape. We're talking about sinusitis, and with me now is Dr. Philip Perlman, Director of Otolaryngology at St. Francis Hospital. Also joining me is Patricia Boltasanti, one of Dr. Perlman's patients. Patricia, let's go back to what, what it was like for you. What uh, what was your motivation, other than, I suppose, pain, that took you to see Dr. Perlman initially? Well, I had had sinus surgery five times already. This, would be, this was my fifth one. And what happens is I have the surgery, and then a couple of years go by, and I get the sinus infections, and they become, you know, like I get four or five a year, and then I have to go on all the medication. And I wait as long as possible to do this because I don't want to put myself through another surgery again. Because the original surgery that I had, I was packed. The first two surgeries I had, I had the packing and the swelling and I missed a week of work. It was very uncomfortable and so I always postponed it as much as possible. The fourth surgery that I had was with Dr. Perlman and it was better than, much better than the, the original ones. But this one was amazing and I had waited five years, was the last one before the surgery. And I waited five years because I knew what I was going to be in for. And when I had this surgery, it was amazing. I could have gone back to work the next day. I felt great. I hadn't, I could smell after 24 hours. I had lost my whole sense of smell and taste. I could smell after 24 hours at the surgery and um, it was amazing no headache. The original ones were, yeah, felt like your head was in a vice. The, mm. head was so, the headaches were so terrible after the surgery. What do you look for then, Dr. Perlman, when somebody like Patty comes in? Well, obviously I look for a way to cure yeah. them of their problems. And, you know, again, Patty was one of the more difficult cases. And there are plenty of Patties <laughs> out there. I mean, there are a lot of people that have chronic sinus disease that have been through this. And Patty had a wonderful result. I couldn't ask for anything as quicker, as quick as her recuperation. Not everybody's like that. Sometimes it takes a little bit more time to recuperate and feel well after a sinus operation. But again, you know, it, it would be hard to uh, do these procedures without these technologies. Um, I, I think that just because we did the surgery on Patty doesn't mean she's out of the woods. She still needs to use these other products. She mm -hmm. needs still to be on a regimen of <coughs> nasal steroid sprays and washes and irrigations and, and just keeping on top of it. First signs of, of an infection, she needs to call, call me and we can talk about how to treat this. Uh, just like a patient with asthma can't stay off their asthma sprays, they have to be maintained by a pulmonologist. Same type of thing here. 